everybody into the room. Thank you everyone for joining us. We'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the latest Duke media briefing on the 2020 election. I'm Gregory Phillips with Duke Communications and I'm moderating this event. Right now, America is holding its breath. Millions of ballots are still being counted and the presidency remains too close to call after one of the most fraught elections in the nation's history. We have three Duke scholars with us today, experts in politics, election integrity and constitutional law to discuss the development so far and what to look for in the days to come. I'll introduce our speakers and get the discussion started, then we'll open it up to questions. If you're joining us on Zoom, you can submit questions via the Q&A window at any time for me to ask. There will also be an opportunity for you to ask questions in person in a few minutes. Thanks also to everyone watching this on YouTube. With us today is Guy Uriel Charles. He is a professor of law at Duke Law School and co-director of the Duke Law Center on Law, Race and Politics. He teaches and writes about constitutional law, election law, campaign finance, redistricting, politics and race. Good morning to you. Also joining us is Judith Kelly. She is Dean of the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke, where she is also a senior fellow with the Keenan Institute for Ethics. Her areas of research include human rights, democracy, and international election observation. Good morning, Dean Kelly. Good morning. And we have Mac McCorkle. He is a professor of the practice at the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke and director of the Polis Center for Politics. McCorkle was an issues consultant to democratic political candidates, state governments, and others for more than 25 years. Good morning to you. Hey, Greg. Okay, Dean Kelly, we'll start with you. Uh, in every election, there are absentee ballots that in some states aren't counted until after the polls close on election day. And there are millions more than usual this year because of the pandemic. Is it at all surprising or suspect that it could take several days to count all of these ballots? Greg, thank you so much for that question. No, it, it is not. I would say as a, as a scholar of, of international election observation and having observed uh, and followed elections around the world, I think what's really notable here um, is so far is, is what didn't happen. We can discuss later lots of things that did happen, but what didn't happen was uh, uh, lots of unrest and, uh, and uh, contestation in uh, polling spaces. People showed up in droves, people stood in line, people voted, it was peaceful. And what's playing out right now is, is perfectly normal in a mature democracy. That is, we have to take time to count all the ballots. And especially given that some uh, jurisdictions didn't allow the commencement of counting the ballots until the day of elections, and that in some places those tallied in the millions, it is absolutely no surprise that they haven't managed to open all those envelopes, straighten out all those ballots, and get them counted at this point. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Certainly lots more to dig into there, but Professor Charles, we'll move on to you. Uh, President Trump claimed victory overnight and said he would go to the Supreme Court to stop these absentee ballots from being counted. What grounds could a legal argument use to stop counting in the various states where it's still happening? Are there any grounds for such an argument? The, the issue is that's not how it works. You don't just go to the Supreme Court if you have an issue. So you have to have a legal basis for it. And, um, and you would have to file a lawsuit in one of the lower courts, either in the state court or in the federal court. Um, he might then lose and then appeal and then can appeal that to the Supreme Court, or he might ask for an emergency ruling if he has lost at the lower court. But you first have to start at the lower courts and file the lawsuit. And then there has to be a basis, a legal basis for the lawsuit. And I'm happy to talk about that more later. Um, but, the, but his lawyers will have to identify a reason why, like a law that has been violated, a constitutional rule that has been violated, <clears throat> a state rule that has been violated. So until, unless he can do that, then he can't file a lawsuit. But he certainly can't simply just run to the US Supreme Court and file a lawsuit there that just not have this process uh, or our legal system operates. Absolutely, thank you. And certainly lots of follow-up questions I've got for you there. But for right now, we'll just move on to Professor McCorkle and talk about North Carolina for a moment. Uh, President Trump and Senator Tom Tillis are both ahead in North Carolina, uh, but the state hasn't been called. Uh, and the state says there's about 117,000 mail-in ballots that have not been returned. But what should we be bearing in mind about this process as it pertains to North Carolina in particular? Well, uh, in, it does look like the Republicans have had a big night in, a big night last night in North Carolina, but it should be pointed out that the Biden campaign is not conceding North Carolina and that there are around 117,000 ba mail ballots that have not been returned. Now, some of those may simply be a situation where people decided to go ahead and vote in person uh, and, and otherwise didn't uh, 
uh, file those, uh, but they also have time if they're postmarked properly by the uh, yes by yesterday, if they have to, until November 12th to get in. So there is some possibility there. And there are some provisional ballots that need to be checked. Uh, the Democrats would need to sweep those, Biden and a lot of the other Democrats who seem to have lost statewide would need to sweep those uh, numbers. Uh, and it's a little hard to see, but it's still an open question. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all of our panelists for those opening answers. We have a lot more to dig into. And so we'll continue with that. Dean Kelly, I'd like to come back to you. Um, as an observer of international elections and, and, and somebody who studies this, kind of what has struck you about this campaign so far and the current moment we're in as it pertains to other mature democracies around the world? Greg, um, what really struck me is how the playbook leading up to this election has looked so familiar from a perspective of international election observers. Uh, that is, we've seen so many behaviors that we don't consider playing by the rules of a mature democracy. And so notwithstanding what I said about the uh, integrity of the process yesterday in people actually casting their ballots and then being tallied and tabulated today, uh, I, I think that no matter who wins, the loser is clear. Uh, it is American democracy that has lost uh, in this electoral period. Shared values and norms and I really think that Humpty Dumpty has fallen off the wall. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dean Kelly. And that is a scary image for sure. But Professor Charles, I'd like to come back to you. As you correctly pointed out, um, nobody can go straight to the Supreme Court and demand this or that. You have to follow these channels. One of the questions we've had come through is that, are there any particular states where you think it's most likely that we would see um, a challenge from the Trump campaign to attempt to stop vote counting? And what form do you think that could take? Sure. So here's what is likely to happen. I don't think they can stop the votes from being counted. Um, I think what likely that will happen is once uh, there's a sense of uh, outcomes in various states, the Trump campaign will have to determine um, how close uh, is the outcome in particular states and which states would make a difference. Um, for him to win, to win the election. So let's say it comes down to three states. I'm gonna make them up for a minute. Um, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania as an example. Uh, so they might decide that, look, we need to, the election is close in those states. If we can turn those states, then we can win. And now they have to, they have to go through the election laws of each of those states and to see, is there something that went wrong in those states? And every state provides a mechanism for challenging the results of the election. So if there's a problem with vote counting, there's a problem with um, the tabulation, or if there's some other irregularity. Uh, every state has rules as to how, how you go about doing it. And there's a timing as to when it should be done. Um, and so you have to go state by state and look at the rules of that state and state court and using the state processes. Um, so do you first, do a contest with the state board of elections or is it done at the county level, right? So every state has particular rules for how you do that. And then there's a different process, which is that if they believe that there's been a violation of federal law, then they can go straight into federal court and then say, hey, something happened here um, that then causes, that caused the violation of federal law. You only counted certain ballots, you didn't count others, and therefore that's a violation of federal law. So they have two bases, state court and state court processes and election processes or federal court, but it all depends on where they think it is in their best interest to file these lawsuits because getting, the, getting some extra votes or getting the votes changed um, will then um, cause an outcome in the election and then turn the election in their favor. Um, so the political circumstances are what's going to determine what the legal strategy looks like. Sure, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and as a follow up then, um, unlike in a situation like in 2000, when all the attention was focused on one state, 
Uh, do you think it's possible that we could see um, challenges at the state level in multiple states, while at the same time maybe challenges at the federal level to say that federal law was violated in those same states? Is that something we could see, a kind of two-tiered approach? Definitely. So it, it will be surprising if you actually don't see a two-tiered approach. Um, it is um, unlikely that they will just start in state court or that they would use the state processes for contesting or protesting an election result. Uh, so more than likely, if they think that they have a legal basis and um, that that it will help them, that if you know if it's if it's close, so I think for Wisconsin, I think it's Wisconsin that's um, where Biden um, has a twenty thousand vote lead, um, right? So in places where it is close and they think that they have a legal basis, they will likely follow a dual track system, both the state process as well as file in federal court. Again, you can't just walk into the federal court and say I lost, right? You have to have a legal basis for saying there's a law that has been violated that, um, that undermines our constitutional rights and therefore you have to provide me a remedy. So they, are, they will need to have a legal basis for doing so as well. Sure, absolutely, thank you. Uh, Professor McCorkle, I'd like to move on to you. Obviously one of the things that we will see in, uh, in states where the vote is very, very close is the possibility for a recount. And one of the questions that we've had come in is uh, what the parameters are for, uh, requirements are for a recount to take place in North Carolina um, uh, in statewide races and how likely you think it might be that that happens? Well, I, I'm, maybe I'll, I'll defer to, to, to Guy. He may be on top of this. Uh, it, my understanding is that in the statewide race, you need to be within 10,000 votes to be able to request the recount. In a non-statewide race, uh, it's uh, one, within 1%. One so right now that doesn't seem to be uh, well. There, there's are there Republican uh, there's a, a, some Republican state uh, council of state uh, candidates who might be able to fit that that tight window. And if the vote changed because of of uh, changes, modifications in the vote, and new absentee uh, mail votes coming in, maybe the Democrats, maybe even Biden, would get close enough to uh, be able to call for a recount. But it, I think it is for federal and state statewide races, 10,000, within 10,000 votes. Thank you very much. Um, and as a follow-up question uh, we've had from, from several people, uh, could you talk about um, what, one thing we've seen in, in North Carolina, um, and it's not the first time we've seen it, is uh, a state that went for uh, a Republican for president but kept a Democrat governor. And this question has been phrased in, uh, in many different ways. But one, uh, one way that's interesting I've seen it phrased is what do you make of a voter who could make that choice for two candidates with such opposite views uh, of, of, for example, of how to handle COVID? I mean, what does that say about the North Carolina voter that, that they could kind of split that? Yeah, well, not to get into a political science lecture, but uh, uh, it, all politics is national, especially in North Carolina. So when you look at the vote from the president on down to the state judicial races, the, the tightness, the closeness of the, of the Republican Democratic split is just simply extraordinary. Uh, and so Governor Cooper, who had distinguished himself uh, on kind of non-ideological grounds, I think on handling the COVID crisis was one candidate who was able to differentiate himself enough from that one or two points that were hurting, uh, that were, Democrats were losing to Republicans in almost every race, as well as the two incumbents, three incumbents at the Council of State, uh, Attorney General Stein, Secretary of State Marshall, and Auditor Beth Wood, the Democratic incumbents barely won, not even anywhere near as uh, the four or five point margin that Governor Cooper was at. So the answer is that voters are not voting in the individual races anymore, or very few are. Most voters are voting straight ticket loyalty, not so much because they're pro-Republican or pro-Democrat, but the Republicans are anti-Democrats and the Democrats are anti-Republicans. And that's, it's all ideological and it's all national. North Carolina is a really good example of that, just looking at the data. 
Sure, thank you very much. Um, I'd remind everybody, we've had lots of questions come in and that's great, please keep them coming. You can type your questions into the Q&A window at any time. Uh, you can also raise your hand in Zoom and we can unmute you if you'd like to ask a question in person. If you're joining by phone, you can hit star nine to unmute yourself in Zoom. Uh, Dean Kelly, we've had a, a follow-up question for you. You mentioned about democracy losing. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more what you meant by that, maybe by giving us some examples of the playbook you mentioned, of the things that you've seen happen in this in this election cycle that, that make you feel that way. Well, sure. Um, I mean, not leaving, leaving aside what, what's happened just in, in the last four years in terms of norms that have been broken. If we just look at elections and, and how mature uh, democracies are expected to conduct themselves around elections, we've had a number of things that are unusual for uh, for, for mature democracies and that election monitors normally would be concerned about and have been concerned about. Uh, for example, undermining confidence in the election by claiming that it will be rigged before the election has even, uh, uh, the polling has even started. Uh, hinting at the need to delay an election, suggesting that one might stay in office uh, beyond the constitutionally allowed period. Um, uh, you know, uh, showing misinformation about what the normal election process is, claiming victory prematurely, attacking the free media, seeking to interfere in the proper conduct of the election by suggesting that we should stop counting. Now, I, I could go on. And I think those are just kind of behaviors by the candidates, but then there's a number of other things too that are more systematic that uh, the OSCE actually issued a preliminary report uh, just a few days ago um, that was backing up one they issued in the summer that points out to a number of concerns uh, that are more systematic in the American electoral system. And I think the point that those really drive home is that, uh, you know, United States has been uh, the, one of the oldest established democracies in the world. And that also means that we made the rules a long time ago. And modern, a lot of modern democracies have leapfrogged over us and they have uh, they have rules and procedures in place that are uh, more impartial and systems that are better at, 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 at uh, ensuring that the electoral process represents the, the, the will of the voters. And so it may be time uh, at some point for a renovation of the American democracy. Sure, thank you very much. Um, Professor Charles, we've had another follow-up question for you. You've, um, you explained very clearly uh, how uh, a challenge is likely to form once you know once results are known. And we've had some questions about timing. So, would you expect that um, we won't see any kind of legal challenges until um, states have, if not certified, at least announced their final numbers? That's when you would expect to see any kind of machinery of legal challenges take place. Is that what we should expect as regards timing, or is there something else we should be looking at? No, not necessarily. So, every state will have different sets of rules for their for when. Um, a candidate or a person. So in some states like North Carolina, it could be any voter um, can file a protest. And so you have to look at the particular rules of the state. Now, once the votes have been tabulated in which they've been posted um, and, and the process, the canvassing process starts, um, then the clock usually starts then as well. So it just depends on what the rules for each state um, will be. And there's a strategic advantage um, that, can't, that campaigns are going to seek uh, in order to make sure that they file whatever they want to file before the count becomes official. Because once it has been certified as official, it's actually really difficult to counter um, the official certification. So you are likely to see a lot of legal maneuvering before the counts, the, the elections are certified as being the official results. And, and that period of time uh, will vary depending upon the state, what each particular state requires depending on each state's rules. Now, if you go into federal court just to file a constitutional lawsuit, you can do so anytime. And um, and you'd likely do so as soon as you as you as you can because it's going to take a while and the federal machinery um, happens as well. December fourteenth is when the electors are going to sit down and, and vote, right? So there's a little bit of a timing on this, both on the federal side as well as on the, on the state side that one has to pay attention to. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and thanks everybody for the questions that are rolling in. Uh, we're going to get to as many of them as we can. And in some cases, I'm combining them and compounding them so we can get them answered. And with that um, in mind, Mac McCorkle, uh, uh, some questions we've had here, obviously turnout in North Carolina was extremely high. 
Um, historically, we tend to say that high turnout favors Democrats, but it certainly didn't appear to in North Carolina. Um, d were we mistaken, uh, those political observers who thought North Carolina was purple? Should we let go of that notion? What do you think the high turnout and the results of that high turnout this year mean for North Carolina? Well, a uh, couple things. The, the assumption that high turnout is always good for Democrats or Democrats in North Carolina in federal races really doesn't have much support. The only time that we have, besides the unusual now, what seems the unusual election of 2008, when President Obama won here and Senator Hagan uh, won against uh, Elizabeth Dole, you, uh, Democrats have not won a U.S. Senate seat in a presidential election year. They have actually won it in the midterm uh, years. Going back to my mentor and former president, Duke, Duke President Terry Sanford, Robert Morgan, John Edwards, the North Carolina victories actually came in smaller turnout elections in midterms. So the idea, of, I, I would challenge that idea. Uh, and then of course, at the presidential level, you would go all the way back to 1976 after 2008 to find a time when uh, uh, there was another time when a Democratic presidential candidate won here. So uh, I, I would question the higher turnout. The, uh, the Biden did uh, did better than Hillary Clinton and did uh, added on more votes uh, to the Democratic column than, than Trump added on to the Republican column. He closed the margin from almost four percentage point loss to Clinton to what looks like and might even get tighter, a one and a half percentage point loss. So Biden did better. There was big turnout in the big city counties uh, in strong numbers for Biden. There were just strong, strong numbers, almost as strong numbers as Trump for Trump in the exurban and, and rural and small town areas. Again, Biden did better off the 2016 baseline uh, than that. But the idea that a high turnout is is always good for Democrats in North Carolina actually doesn't have that much grounding. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Um, thanks again, everybody, for the questions. Keep them coming in. We'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, Dean Kelly, something that you have talked and written about is how much democracy relies not so much on norms or laws, but on norms and just um, accepted agreement, agreed standards of behavior that have certainly been challenged uh, by President Trump's unconventional approach to most of everything over the last four years. Do you think, regardless of um, how the dust settles after this election, does um, part of the, the revision that you've talked about that America may need to make it to its democracy, encoding some of those norms as laws, and what do you think specifically maybe America should do uh, to kind of protect its democracy rolling forward in ways that right now have, have just been norms rather than actual legally encoded? I, it, that's a good question because at, at some point I don't think one can just legislate and regulate everything so that there is no um, dependency on norms and values. You know, democracy rests on a social contract between citizens and that social contract has to do with a level of, 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 of trust and understanding and, and it, these are the kinds of things that manifest themselves in making concession speech when it's warranted, et cetera, which is, you know, can't legislate, you know, you must make a, con uh, a concession speech or you must not claim victory if you, if you haven't, you can't legislate these things. These are norms and, uh, and it's very difficult to legislate them. There are things that can be done, I think. Uh, and I think it's unrealistic to see them happen in, in, in a long time, but we are headed towards a situation potentially, right? Where for the third time in six elections, uh, the the winner of the presidency might be taking might be winning through the electoral college rather than through the popular vote. You know that is that is very bizarre for a mature democracy, <clears throat> and it's a system that was invented. And he can speak more to this, but it's a system that was invented uh, invented to protect against things that is not really what it is doing <clears throat> right now. Uh, you know the reasons it was invented is not how it is manifesting itself now. Um, and so that's certainly something to be revisited, but there are other things too that just the, uh, the one person, one vote, there are things that we have in place that, that prevent you know, felons and others from voting. And I mean, there, there are so many things that we have that have sort of gone off the rails in our democracy 
with respect to you know, gerrymandering or, uh, or I think one of the more prominent examples is simply that we, we run so many of our electoral systems are headed by partisan uh, officials. And, and that's just something that differs a lot from, from most democracies. Most democracies, mature democracies will have independent electoral oversight bodies. And so there are certainly ways that over time, we may be able to uh, fix some of these issues. But at the end of the day, I think it, it has to be about a, a conversation among citizens about what values we actually hold dear in the long run that we want that, that, that we want to hold on to that are more important than immediate uh, short term gains. Sure, thank you very much. And, and before we move on, and Professor Charles, I'd love for you to weigh in on this too. Um, Dean Kelly, I'm wondering if you could talk about, you mentioned the Electoral College, and we know that changing that would obviously take a massive shift in, in American yeah. thinking, it seems. But can you talk about how unusual that system is uh, for a president to be able to be elected while losing the popular vote, as we've seen happen several times in the last 20 years here? I mean, does that, are there any other countries in which a system exists that allows that to happen? It's, it's, it's really, really unusual. I mean, I don't want to you know, go on record saying nowhere where, where, where there's, there's similar systems, but you know, it, this, it, this is an, a national level election in a direct democracy. Uh, normally you would expect the citizens, every single vote to count equally. And that is simply not the case. The ballot that you went and cast last night uh, or yesterday or in an early election or an absentee ballot is not a vote that will be directly tallied for or against who wins the White House in, in, in a direct manner. And that is really unusual. And, um, and, and is, is not how we expect democracies to work these days. George, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Charles, certainly interested in any thoughts you have um, on the Electoral College, but we also have another question that's, uh, that's come in for you. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, up top that there's no legal grounds to just stop counting absentee ballots. Um, but and, and as you've mentioned, obviously, state law varies from state to state. But in terms of challenges um, that are likely, obviously, you know, in, in 2000, it was all about the hanging chads and whether these things constituted an actual vote or not. Would you expect to see challenges around the nature of provisional votes? Or, you know, President Trump has made some claims without apparently any evidence that, that large numbers of mail-in absentee ballots constitutes um, the potential for fraud. Is, is that where you think any challenges will be targeted, just a claim that mail-in absentee ballots are open to fraud and therefore shouldn't be counted? Or do you have any sense of, of, of um, how uh, a particular state, they might challenge the results there? Sure. Um, I think the likeliest challenge will be to absentee ballots, but not, not mail-in absentee ballots or absentee ballots in general. That's just part of the process and consistent with the process. But in a state like North Carolina or in Pennsylvania, where courts change the rules, the state law, in order to in order to, for COVID accommodation, and said, look, if absentee ballots are received a few days after the election, then they ought to be counted, provided that they are not clearly postmarked as having been mailed after election day. Um, so those absentee ballots. Um, I think are um, that there's a potential of challenging them. Uh, there's a constitutional argument that some members of the Supreme Court um, will accept. Um, is it more than three? Is it five? I'm not sure, but close to five. So close to a majority of the court would, would likely accept if the case gets before them that um, courts can't change electoral rules as written by the state legislature. And so, um, but those are limited um, set of cases and only a number of states. And so if it came, if the election does come down to say North Carolina and Pennsylvania, let's assume that um, Trump wins say Wisconsin or, or Michigan and, and another state and it really comes down to North Carolina and Pennsylvania. Well, it is possible to challenge and they would challenge the absentee, the ruling and the absentee ballots that come in 
after election day. Um, they would argue that a court does not have the power, whether it's a state court or a federal court, does not have the power to change the rules as written by the state legislature because the constitution gives the state legislature the power to enact rules for presidential election. So that's a, that's a live argument. Um, that's one basis, but the political circumstances in which that happens are very, is that, that circumstances are very limited. And I'm happy to keep going, Greg, if you want, or you yeah. just can get it and yeah, jump in. Yeah. Sorry about that. I was uh, I was muted as I went to ask a follow up question. Um, <laughs> and before I move on, Professor Charles, I'd like to ask you, we've had a question come in about the electoral votes from Maine, which of course is unusual in that its electoral votes can be split um, based on. And could you just explain a little bit, you know, um, how that works and why Maine is different from other states? Sure. Maine and Nebraska are the two examples. Um, the state legislature can determine how to allocate electoral votes however way it wants. Almost well, every single state has said that we will do a popular vote. Um, but if a state wanted to, if it simply wanted to appoint um, electoral, the electoral, uh, the electors for that state without doing a popular vote, it can do that. It could say that we're gonna do a popular vote and the winner of the state's popular vote gets all of the electors. It could do that. It could say we're going to do a popular vote and we're going to apportion depending upon, you know, if you get 60% of the votes, you're going to get 60% of the electors, right? So the state can, can decide to appoint um, electors um, in whatever manner that it wants, as long as it's not inconsistent with the broad rules of the constitution. So you can't say, look, we're, not, we're gonna discount the votes of women or people of color or whatever, right? So you can't, you can't violate the constitution, but you can de determine the method of appointment however you want. So some states have said, look, we're going to, Maine and Nebraska are good examples, uh, that they're going to uh, um, allow um, appointment, give, give some power to the congressional districts, uh, and then the rest of the electoral votes will go to the winner of the popular of, of the state popular vote. Um, and that's perfectly consistent with the power that is delegated to the state. So it's up to states to decide how they want to do that appointment. Uh, and those states are, um, they've deviated from what the rest of the states have done. Sure, absolutely. Thank you for that. And thank you for managing the awkward silence when I didn't realize I was muted just now. Uh, <laughs> Professor McCorkle, we will come back to you and North Carolina. We've got lots of questions coming in about North Carolina. Um, and uh, one question is, are there any statewide races that you are watching closely because you think that the absentee ballots could actually make a difference uh, in those races? So that, uh, because there are some, it seems like it, it's unlikely to, but are there any that you think could? Uh well, the, there could be uh, the, the Josh Stein attorney general race is very, very close, but the Democrat Josh Stein has an advantage there. So I would think that those numbers would, he would only increase his numbers. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I think there might be one or two uh, other races that might be affect, but again, it's going to have to be, um, it could turn around one or two uh, challengers in the Council of State races. I think the judicial races, there's a, oh, oh no, in Sherry Beasley, excuse me, for Chief Justice, it could ma matter in the, uh, 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 she looks to appear to be losing the Chief Justice position, which the Democrats would still have a 4-3 majority, but would lose the Chief Justice. So that would be the one that I would think would be most important for that. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and uh, we've got, I'm going to ask you another North Carolina question because we've got a ton of them. One thing uh, that we know, obviously, is that the Senate race uh, ended up being the most expensive in the country's history. Um, how much do you think um, outside money uh, is particular is, is a factor in North Carolina politics right now? Do you expect that to continue to be the case? Or was it just a particular flashpoint because this was a race that mattered so much nationally this year? For many years, you know, I, I first really started North Carolina politics when Jim Hunt ran against Jesse Helms, and I think it was the biggest spending Senate race in history there, or close to it. North Carolina has had a history of this because even for many years, we've been so closely, uh, there have been so many close contests. I'm not sure the money mattered much uh, except to cancel out the other side. Uh, in even looking at Cal Cunningham's vote, it seems very similar to the other 
uh, to the partisan split that, that Trump established against Biden. Again, maybe a little bit of a drop off for Cunningham, but not much. My sense of the TV is, again, you don't want the other side to, to be able to hit and you have nothing to counter with. But my sense is that the TV kind of balanced each other. The TELUS Cunningham TV balanced uh, each side out until perhaps at the end uh, on the sexual affair may have hurt Cunningham some. But again, his numbers are really no different than a lot of the other Democratic numbers uh, up and down the ballot that you're seeing. Sure, thank you very much. Um, Dean Kelly, I'd like to come back to you. As you mentioned at the very beginning, there is nothing unusual about the fact that it's gonna take a few days to count these ballots. However, you know, we've already seen um, President Trump prematurely declare victory last night. Um, you mentioned the playbook that we've seen you know, in other uh, countries where democracy maybe came under threat. Um, patience is obviously gonna be key over the next few days, but are there things that you are concerned about that could happen between now and then because pressure will be brought to bear um, you know, against that patience, whether it's, you know, um, actual kind of violence in the streets or certain kinds of uh, uh, pressure that might be brought to bear. I mean, what is your experience in other countries? What does that tell you about what we might see um, as people try to bring these counts um, under pressure in order to prevent them from happening? Well, thanks, Greg. You know, it's interesting because um, the, the, the Carter Center, as you know, it was one of the oldest organizations in the world doing election observation, and they've observed elections all around the world, but never in the United States, and decided this time around that they were going to turn their attention to the United States. And they did so precisely mentioning that there are a number of volatile elements in this election that they've seen in elections elsewhere where they decide to spend their time, such as racial tensions and extreme polarization. Um, and, uh, and, and the, you know, attacks on the media and such. And so the post-election period like this can be a very volatile period, but I was very encouraged by the peacefulness of yesterday. And I think much will depend on the rhetoric that the candidates themselves and their party um, uh, officials choose to engage in over the next couple of days. Uh, it, they hold it in their hands to give signals to their voters. And I would urge everyone uh, to signal that we should all stand by and let this election play out and show the world that we know how to count ballots and to do that in a fair way and that we will respect the results. And that kind of message, I think, from both parties has the capacity to, uh, to calm uh, the tensions. Obviously, Contrary messages, um, especially ones that are, you know, uh, have a lot of exclamation points after them and such, can have the opposite effect. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Professor Charles, I'd like to come back to you. We've had a, a follow up question. You mentioned about how courts are generally reluctant to um, overturn state level election law. Um, and a question that we had here was that here in North Carolina recently, uh, according to the question, the state attorney general and elections board change the rules to extend when votes could come in uh, after, um, after an election, um, when, as the reporter understood it, that's an authority that the legislature has. So do you think that there's a chance in North Carolina or perhaps elsewhere that if elections boards um, have maybe changed policies um, in ways that were reserved for decisions being made by the state legislature, that's an avenue under which um, vote totals could be challenged? Yeah, it's the same set of arguments that... Um, here's a statute that the legislature passed to regulate uh, presidential elections, and then somebody other than the legislature changed it, whether it's a state court that extended the deadline by three days and absentee balloting, or whether it's state board of elections or the governor, right? Um, yes, yeah, so I think that argument uh, would apply to those circumstances as well. Sure, absolutely, thank you. Um, uh, Mac McCorkle, swinging back to you, we've had some more North Carolina questions. Um, we have a question regarding, and I'm not sure if it's too soon to ask this, if you've seen the numbers, but what the polling suggests uh, for how um, the Black and Latinx turnout in North Carolina uh, affected the results. Uh, did they follow kind of traditional voting patterns? Is there anything that you've seen that leapt out at you about that, if, if those numbers have impact? I, I don't have the, egg, uh, the exit polling uh, in front of me. And, but but that, that's available. Uh, I'm pretty dubious about it, uh, exit polling 
especially when everybody when so many people vo voted before. I know pollsters were trying to to absorb that. I, I can tell you though that you know the thing that I, Democrats need to be aware of is that the uh, the Latinx or Hispanic vote in, in North Carolina it leans to the Democrats, and I think that that would would be in support of that. Uh, you find support in that in the data, but it's not anywhere near like the African American uh, vote in North Carolina. The African American vote in North in North Carolina Democratic Party is the base. It's the biggest uh, population grouping in the Democratic Party. So I think, as based on other states, you're going to see a lot of interest, especially if it's post-Trump, in uh, uh, trying to peel off even more of the Hispanic or, or Latinx vote uh, to the Republicans uh, is, is my main. Now, the other interesting little tidbit that, that in North Carolina is the Lumbee Indian vote in Robson County. Robson County has been one of those counties that switched back and forth and has been a national bellwether in the last three elections and continues to be a national bellwether, meaning that it went for Obama twice but it's now gone for Trump and went big for Trump. And that probably was a strong Lumbee Indian vote. So not just white rural vote, uh, uh, Trump was, was able to win a very mixed race county in Robson, which I think people should be interested in. But I don't have the, the uh, exit polling in front of me and I'm pretty suspicious of the accuracy of the exit polling anyway. <laughs> Sure, absolutely. Thank you. And for those who are interested, uh, there is a, a long history of federal officials courting uh, the Lumbees of Robertson County with official federal recognition. Uh, so it's something they have still struggled to get. Um, Dean Kelly, coming back to you, um, one of the reasons that we're in this very tense situation right now is yeah. because some states count their absentee ballots that they've received before Election Day and announce the results. And some obviously don't begin counting them until after the polls close, which is the situation we're in now. Do you think that there is um, any hope or any likelihood that in order to, to uh, avoid this kind of confusion moving forward, that maybe states will, the states that right now don't start counting until afterwards will perhaps uh, change their rules, look at that so that um, all states, or at least most states, certainly the crucial states, are, are counting these ballots when they come in so that the uh, announcements can be made sooner. Do you think there's any likelihood of that? You know, I think one of the one of the strengths from a hacking perspective of American elections is that they are so decentralized. But there are some things that it doesn't make sense to have so uh, so different from one state to another. Uh, you know, as you said, it's not just when you can start counting, but it's also how late can a ballot arrive and still be allowed to be counted, as we know, and and, and as has recently been. Uh, uh, opined on by the Supreme Court in a couple of state cases. And so I think these are precisely the kinds of things that we could look to standardize because uh, voters should have the same rights in every state. You know? So it, 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 you know, states might go about the logistics of elections in different ways. But you know, if, if a voter in you know, Nebraska goes to the post office and mails his absentee ballot you know, five days before the election and somebody else does that in a different state, they should have the same rights uh, in terms of the processing of that ballot. And so I think that's definitely something. Um, and especially now that we've seen that uh, absentee ballot use has been so high this election, we might expect that to be a pattern that continues now that people have, have, um, have learned how to use it and also that um, we have become more sophisticated about allowing the tracking of those uh, paper ballots. Uh, so, and, and for, for hopefully, you know, we won't have COVID four years from now, but then there may continue to be reasons why people uh, have preferences for casting ballots that way. Sure, absolutely, thank you. Uh, moving on, Professor Charles, have another question for you. We've um, heard since this briefing started, uh, to the surprise of no one, that the Trump campaign is likely to request a recount in Wisconsin uh, once we, you know, it seems there's some confusion over whether that state's been called for Biden or not, but they'll request a recount. Obviously, we should expect to see recounts in any state where the numbers are close enough for those to be requested. But what I want to ask you is that, uh, do you expect to see um, legal challenges to, in these states kind of holding off? If they ask for a recount, are they going to allow the recount to happen before they challenge or because of the need to kind of expedite this thing if you want a court to hear it? Would you expect that to be one of many 
um, kind of multifaceted challenges. They request a recount, but at the same time are also challenging the validity of mail-in absentee ballots or, or something else. Yeah, my expectation is that they would do both. Um, you certainly want to request a recount uh, because you want to get as clear of a sense as possible what the gap is. Um, because that might also affect what your legal strategy is going to be. Um, and so in an interesting irony, many, some people may or may not remember uh, what happened in 2000 in Bush versus Gore. Uh, what was interesting is that the strategy of the Gore team actually helped Bush, the legal strategy, and um, in terms of where they sought um, um, recounts and the strategy of the Bush scene, like what they wanted to do, actually help Gore. So, um, you know, it, it, it matters when to, to, to think about, hey, what, what is the gap? Um, am I trying to exhaust? Do I think that there's, there's going to be a pocket of votes that weren't either properly counted or something happened there? Uh, so that matters and you, and you want to think about that. Uh, and then it might also affect how you think um, whether that that helps you determine whether there's something that went wrong in the process. You know, but again, you know, there's there's there are a couple things that are important to note. Timing really matters. Perception really matters. This is one of the reasons why the president came out um, in the middle of the morning to try to set the perception. I'm ahead. I won. Um, so all of those things matter and getting an accurate count so that way you have an understanding of how far behind uh, you are, um, that matters as well, but you want to get your the legal cases going because sometimes it takes, a, you know, courts will expedite these cases, but they still are going to take some time. Uh, so it won't surprise me that if they're pursuing both at the same time. Sure, thank you. Um, and we've also had a request for a clarification from a, for a point you made earlier. You mentioned that it's uh, harder to make a legal argument against the results once the votes are canvassed. Um, and we had a reporter who was asking um, for you to clarify, are you talking about specifically, you know, at the state level, or does that go for canvasses at a county level uh, as well? Is it, uh, are votes, after votes are canvassed on a county level, is it more likely the votes can be challenged when compared to the final canvas? So here's what I meant, once, once the count has been certified, um, right. Once the, the 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 internal process of the state has happened, they've canvassed the votes. It's gone through the county. It's gone through the state, and there's a certification. Now, what you're trying to do through litigation is overturn that certification. Um, that turns out to be really hard to do. A court actually has to say that, okay, there's something that went so wrong in this process that I'm going to overturn the official results. Um, now, it's different when you're challenging before you get to the certification process, you're challenging, you're, you're doing a protest or a contest. Some states have protests, some states have contests, some have both. Um, so that's different when you're, when you're doing that. But once it has been certified and then you're going to a court and you're asking the court to overturn the official results, um, you know, that turns out that's a, that's a tall order for a court to do. And they better be sure that there's something that actually went wrong in the process in order to overturn the results. Sure, thank you very much for that uh, clarification. Uh, Mac McCorkle, I'd like to come back to you. Beyond North Carolina, one of the questions a lot of people are wondering is if polling is fundamentally broken or if it's just a system that we need to, uh, to discard because in 2016, um, polling was at least widely misinterpreted um, and this year it seems like the same thing has happened. Is this just because um, President Trump it was a candidate the likes of which we had never seen and kind of broke the system or is there just something fundamentally wrong with polling and it's archaic and we should stop paying attention to it? Any thoughts? Well, good question, Greg, or whoever uh, uh, devised that question because I think there, there's some good thoughts that, that I can pick up on. And I did quickly check on the exit polling. So maybe I'll weave that into the end of, end of my answer. I mean, yes, polling is in crisis. It's got a challenge. You know, it's almost like you think of polling as being out of the era when we had three networks and everybody was at home and you could call them on a landline. And polling's been trying to adjust by doing online polling rather than telephone polling and various other things. But it's getting to be more and more of a challenge, uh, more and harder to find a sample that can be trustworthy. I agree also that Trump is a disruptor to this kind of system so that I think polling probably still is accurate when you have an Obama versus a Romney or, a, or, or Obama versus a McCain, but but Trump is a different figure, always kind of pushing the envelope of expectations. But people need to understand polling is a necessarily open 
system. It is not something where systematically the pollster knows or should know really what the turnout is gonna be. That's gotta be based on historical assumptions. And this time, this was unprecedented turnout uh, that they tried to uh, account for. I think the other thing that I would say about polling that is bothersome, and now I'll hit some of my brethren on the progressive side, is this obsession with polling to the idea that Nate Silver or someone can tell you about how the polling, you know, what is really happening and the probabilities of all this. And actually, when you read Nate Silver, he tries to back off of all that probability game. But I think there's a false precision uh, assumption about polling that, that we've simply got to uh, get rid of. And I think especially on the Democratic side or liberal side, you see this, oh, Nate Silver said we're going to win. And I, I just think that's getting more and more foolish as the, the chances for, uh, as the challenges of polling get direct. Exit polling is even worse in my view. So I will say though, that really quick, I did look up the New York Times exit poll. And just for people who are interested, they estimate that the white vote was 64% uh, in North Carolina. The black vote was 60, 24, which is a little above the state average. Hispanic Latino, even though that gets talked a lot about, only registers at 5%. That's gonna keep going up, but it's still at 5%. And then Asian 2% and other 5%. And again, the numbers that you, don't, you don't know if you want to trust completely, but Biden scored below 32% with whites. And that usually is very problematic for Democrats in, um, in North Carolina. Obama got up to 35% of whites, as well as a, a big uh, African-American turnout in 2008 and slipped below that. Again, approximately uh, on that. But again, I really think that exit polling needs to be treated with a lot of grains of salt. Gotcha. Thank you. And I'm glad that you moved on to the uh, notion of turnout because we had another question that I wanted to, to ask you about. Um, obviously, turnout, as you said, was extremely high in North Carolina, but some of these um, these races are specifically the North Carolina Supreme Court are so very, very tight. I mean, does that mean, you know, that, could you talk a little bit about how important each and every vote is? This is what the reporter is asking, because I mean, does it show more than ever that, you know, your vote really counts, especially in North Carolina, because things were so close? Yes, it, it, on, the one, it, it, on the one hand, it does. Everything matters. Your vote really matters in North Carolina, I guess, is, is, is a true statement. Uh, the, the fewer swing voters we have, the, uh, the more important they can be in these close races. So um, the, the people who, for instance, split their ticket for Cooper uh, uh, was an important stance. But the, the negative about that is, that I think people are not sifting through the candidates uh, at all like they used to. Not, not that there was that much, there was a lot of party line voting in North Carolina before, but it is very rigid now. So that people ask, well, how can you vote for Cooper and Trump? And uh, you're really voting for one party and then it was really an exception for Cooper, for Cooper's non-ideological handling is how I put it of the coronavirus. So, it, the, the vote is precious in North Carolina, but I don't know if it's being that rationally handled. Uh, it, it's really pretty ideologically captured in North Carolina. Sure, thank you. Um, and Dean Kelly, I'd like to ask you something similar. Obviously at its heart, democracy is supposed to be about participation. And we have seen, you know, turnout is often so very disappointing um, uh, for a functioning democracy, but we've, we've seen um, very high turnout by American standards this year. Is that something that you're encouraged by or are you disheartened by, as, as Max said, the fact that we're, we're so polarized that it seems like even if we've got increased participation, it's less, um, less thinking participation? Or, or can we be both disheartened and encouraged by what we've seen? I, I definitely think we're capable of holding both emotions in, inside ourselves, but no, it has to be it has to be a win overall that, that more people have turned out than have for decades in, in America. And you know, America has for a long time been trailing uh, other mature democracies and they just scratch their heads and go, why are so few people turning out? And I think that if anything, this election might lead to a, a continuing trend of that because speaking exactly to the point 
uh, uh, that Mac just made and that the, the reporter asked, it is becoming increasingly clear to people that their vote matters. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we'll draw some kind of conclusion here that one person won, just like we did last time around. But the most obvious conclusion is that, that this country is so, so evenly divided, so in some ways so closely divided, and how the election actually happens to come out, then we think, oh, well, that's how it is. This, this side won. But really, it's really 50-50. And, and when that's the case, then, then turnout becomes uh, so much more important. And I think people have felt, uh, have felt that this time around. The people stood in some cases in, our, in lines for a long periods of time because they believed that uh, their vote was going to matter and they were proud of casting that vote. And I think that is something to, to build on. Thank you. Um... Professor Charles, understandably, given the current situation, we focused on your expertise in constitutional law. But before we um, before we sign off here, I wanted to ask you because you study race and politics so much. You know, every um, presidential election, we are told that the growing um, racial diversity in this country means that you know uh, there's going to be a fundamental shift, and you would expect it to be a fundamental shift towards um, the Democrats because they tend to be more in favour of you know expanding um, voting rights and so on. Uh, and yet, um, for the last two presidential elections, we've seen almost like that, that didn't happen in the way it was expected. Is there anything that struck you about um, what we know, at least, about the, uh, the racial composition of turnout this year or which direction America is moving and the extent to which, I guess, the Electoral College is holding the brakes on that, too? Yeah, so great question. I mean, I think what we have are mixed messages. Um, so we have places like Georgia and Texas, and Georgia is a great example. Part of the reason why Georgia is, um, you know, is, uh, was competitive is because of the large population, especially of African-American voters, uh, particularly concentrated in different urban parts of the state. Um, so uh, the growth, and, and then of course you add to that voters of color, uh, Latino voters, um, and, um, and college educated whites, right? So there's a coalition of uh, you know the, what people used to call the rainbow coalition that um, that people thought meant that there was going to be some uh, hegemonic dominance of the Democratic Party, right? And and to some extent we saw evidence of that because you saw Georgia and you saw Texas as as examples of places that um, wouldn't have people wouldn't have thought were competitive four years ago are certainly competitive now and who knows where they're going to be in the future. Now on the other hand, um, we also saw the fact that. Um, notwithstanding some coalition with particular racial and ethnic groups that they don't consider themselves monoliths. So to, to talk about Latino voters, um, I think begins to betray uh, a type of now cultural and political and identity ignorance. Um, but even African-American voters, so one of the things that you, Mag is right to distrust the exit polls, but if you give them any credit, it shows that um, black that Trump made headway, headway among black men, not a ton, but he did among black women as well. Um, and so we are seeing, and of course, um, vote Cuban voters, but not just Cuban voters. You know, we're looking to see what's happening in Nevada and and other places in the Southwest. Um, so it looks like you know, the idea that there's going to be this rainbow coalition composed of um, growing. Uh, folks of color with uh, urban whites and, and um, that then is going to create this wave, this demographic wave and that that's the destiny of the future. Um, I think this election has shown, um, you know, has put the brakes on, on that upward, that sense of upward trajectory, particularly for the Democratic Party, um, all right? And so I think we have to be very careful there. And then one last point um, that, that is interesting is, People have thought about the fact that Trump comes across um, as a racist and the assumption was, look, the appeal that he would have to people of color and to whites and the country would be rejected as a whole. You know, there's another way that race comes into the picture. Um, it wasn't a full repudiation by whites, but also, also not a full repudiation by folks of color. And that complicates our racial narrative. Um, right? How do we think about the fact that he still had some appeal to, you know, as, as Dean Kelly said, I mean, this is a closely divided country, he still had some appeal to a large percentage of voters, including a smaller but distinctive 
percentage of voters who are voters of color. And, and those are things that we're going to have to wrestle with in, in the years to come. Absolutely. Thank you. Certainly lots to wrestle with. Uh, and that's probably a great point at which to leave it. We have reached time here. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much to our panelists, Guy Uriel Charles, Judith Kelly and Mac McCorkle for sharing your perspectives. Uh, our next briefing will almost certainly revisit the, top of the topic of the election. Uh, if you'd like to be on the list for that and other briefings, please email news at duke.edu to let us know. In the meantime, please remember to breathe, be patient and unmute yourself when it's your turn to speak. In the meantime, thank you. Have a great day and take care. Thanks for joining us.